When things break, things shatter. When people pass away, picking up the pieces, picking through the fragments of somebody's life, their work, their ideas, can be like pouring over a jigsaw where you don't know what image it's supposed to make. Or it's like trying to rebuild a broken mirror out of the shards of glass and getting nothing but a cracked and incomplete reflection of what came before. In the case of Bray Wyatt, who tragically passed away in August of 2023, reassembling his grand wrestling narrative in order to continue his legacy can't have been easy. More so than many in wrestling history, Bray was known as a relentless ideator, an unbound imagination constantly straining at the shackles of the medium that he chose to tell his stories in. During his life and career in WWE, Bray's creativity was said to have rubbed some up the wrong way and often put him at odds with WWE's unfalteringly formulaic booking. Cena wins, lol. So does Taker. So does Rollins. So does... Goldberg. But despite the in-ring action telling us that this guy couldn't even hold someone's shoulders down for a three, let alone have the whole world in those hands, Bray's ability to weave a yarn, to bait and breadcrumb trail a mystery, to capture an audience's imagination like so many fireflies in a jar was legendary. It made fans believe even when the higher-ups didn't. It sold a story even when the results fell short. To borrow a phrase from gaming, Bray overcame the ludo-narrative dissonance this notion that, say, Nathan Drake is a happy-go-lucky treasure hunter who's gallivanting around the world when the reality of the gameplay is that he's a mass murderer with some serious air miles. Across multiple characters, Bray told us that he was this charismatic cult leader, an unstoppable monster, a sympathetic but unhinged victim of some past trauma, and audiences bought into that despite the booking, despite the maggots, despite the vast amounts of mystery in a medium that thrives on the obvious. Bray swept us up in the palm of his hands, and even now, we are still following the breadcrumb trail and finding out how deep the rabbit hole can go. This is the legacy of Bray Wyatt. When you talk about Bray Wyatt, you have to talk about legacy. Because Wyndham Rotunda, the man behind the character, is from a remarkable wrestling lineage. His maternal grandfather, Robert Wyndham, was a big star in the 70s and 80s, wrestling as Blackjack Mulligan in singles competition and alongside Blackjack Lanza as tag team duo The Blackjacks, winning titles in both the NWA and the then WWWF. Mulligan's two sons, Barry and Kendall Wyndham, also became wrestlers. Barry particularly had a storied career during the 80s and 90s, which saw him inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame twice. Once as a member of the Four Horsemen, and once as part of the US Express, a tag team he formed with Mike Rotunda. Now, Rotunda's career would perhaps be better known for the character of Erwin R. Scheister, or IRS, but it was his in-ring partnership with Barry Wyndham that led to his real-life partnership with Stephanie Wyndham, Barry's brother. Brother. The pair were married within six months of meeting. The couple's first son, Wyndham, named for his mother's maiden name, was born on the 23rd of May 1987 in Brooksville, Florida. From an early age, he was described as a charismatic kid. He was fascinated by spooky films like Ghostbusters and Beetlejuice and able to recite them word for word along with doing all of the voices. I mean, he's basically Luke Owen. He also devoured R. L. Stein's Goosebumps books and grew into a Stephen King fan as he got older, something he would potentially crib from when he referred to himself as the Eater of Worlds, as that's a phrase used by the clown Pennywise in King's novel It. Unsurprisingly, considering his family background, he was also a massive wrestling fan and felt drawn to WWE's darker, more mysterious characters like The Undertaker and Papa Shango. Soon, that particular fascination began to be put into practice as during senior year at high school in 2005, Wyndham won the Amateur Wrestling State Championship. Though after graduating high school, Wyndham briefly ditched wrestling to concentrate on American football, playing two seasons at the College of the Sequoias in California before being scouted by Troy University in Alabama, moving there for his junior and senior years. But by 2008, Wyndham wasn't getting a lot of time on the field, and with his dream of making it to the NFL slipping away, he decided to ditch college altogether, leaving without graduating, and following his younger brother Taylor into WWE developmental territory, Florida Championship Wrestling. 
As Duke and Bo Rotundo, the pair quickly ascended to win the FCW Tag Team Championships in June 2009, just five months after debuting in February that same year. Wyndham in particular was quickly considered a top prospect, being so agile for his larger frame and, while working out at Hard Knock South where FCW talent did their strength training, even caught the eye of the owner. You might have heard of him. His name's John Cena. This led to even more recognition with WWE higher-ups and eventually to Wyndham being chosen as one of the rookies in the second season of NXT in the summer of 2010 under the tutelage of pro Cody Rhodes. His advice was probably, just, just say stuff about your dad. Wyndham was, unfortunately, also lumped with a brand new gimmick to work with, Husky Harris, an apparent jab at his rather heavy-set appearance from WWE's higher-ups. Now, Wyndham unsurprisingly hated the gimmick, but did give his all in trying to make it work. He was eliminated from NXT mid-season and went back to FCW, but couldn't quite shuck the Husky moniker. That particular weight remained firmly on his shoulders. As Harris, he was called up to the main roster in October as part of the Nexus, and that is where things really took off for old Wyndham. If by took off, you mean his head when it was punted by Randy Orton in January 2011, writing Harris off of TV and sending Wyndham back down to FCW. With Husky Harris proving to be dead weight, Wyndham looked for a refresh, and Triple H agreed that the best character fit was yet to be found, so it was back to the drawing board. And out sprang Axel Mulligan. And that is where things really took off for old Wyndham. If by took off, you mean the slasher villain mask, which was a signature look of that short-lived persona. Because Mulligan might not have actually gone the distance, but the infusion of horror movie inspiration that would become a trademark of Bray's career was plain for all to see. Because behind the mask of Mulligan and the husk of Harris, something was just stating. An idea inspired by wrestling legacy. Because Wyndham looked to the short-lived mid-90s alter ego of dangerous Dan Spivey, Waylon Mercy. Now, Mercy made a name for himself by juxtaposing softly spoken, sinister promos with this animal-like ferocity while between the ropes. He had cult leader charisma and the feel of someone always teetering on the brink of a fit of wild anger. Injuries sadly forced Spivey to retire before the character really took off, but those few promos obviously lit a fire under Wyndham, who drew inspiration from Mercy, as well as from Robert De Niro's Max Cady in Martin Scorsese's 1991 movie Cape Fear, and he channeled it to create something special during an FCW promo class on the 16th of November 2011. The character was said to be based on an eccentric childhood friend of Wyndham called Bray White, who was known among his peers for being crazy enough to headbutt anything because he had no feeling in his face thanks to his head going through a windshield during a car accident when he was a child. Wyndham combined Headbutt Bray's name with the name of his cousin Wyatt, and lo, Bray Wyatt was born. Now, the character was an immediate success with FCW coaches, including Sami Zayn, who noted that he came out and everything about it, the presentation and just the energy, we were like, oh, this is good. This jumps off the page. And Wyndham was even given extra time during promo classes to talk and explore the character, going over the usually allotted minute promo into six or seven minute monologues, which began to flesh the character out and really give him form. Bray Wyatt's lore also expanded to cast him as the mysterious leader of a cult living in the Florida Bayou. Wyndham's mesmerizing powers on the microphone translating well to a character who would also be a master of persuasion and manipulation. The Wyatt persona debuted in FCW in April 2012 in a short-lived alliance with Eli Cottonwood before FCW was rebranded as NXT. Now, despite suffering a torn pectoral muscle in July, Wyatt began to appear on NXT TV throughout the summer in vignettes filmed in the swamps just down the road from the Rotunda family home in Brooksville. And soon, the Wyatt family would welcome their first son, Luke Harper, the dirty vested alter ego of the late John Huber. A second bludgeoning baby boy would soon be added as Eric Rowan was brought into the fold, and the three began to run amok once Wyatt returned to in-ring action, adopting a swinging STO known as the Sister Abigail as his finisher. Now, the fact that no one knew the relevance of the name initially was one of the Wyatt character's earliest crumbs on this breadcrumb trail that would be the narrative 
of his character throughout his career. The trio grew their unnerving act, with Bray slowly building out the lore brick by brick. First, Sister Abigail morphed into this backwards witch who had passed down her teachings to the cult leader, and then there were the rumblings of the man in the woods, a creature with pallid white skin and glaring yellow eyes, capable of killing an alligator. It was a seed of an idea we perhaps wouldn't see bloom until 2019, when the fiend crawled out of hell. Whether this was far-sighted foreshadowing or a clever retcon just goes to show that Wyndham was always iterating on his ideas, constantly looking at threads to pull, loose ends to leave, and then eventually tie up. And character work was key to the Wyatt trio. Eric Rowan later remembered about the early days of the Wyatt family that sometimes we'd watch old interviews of people who were on death row because we're trying to see how they speak. Why do they think they're right? Just their mindset. And I think a lot of that plays into what he was able to create. Less than a year after their first appearance on NXT, talk had already turned to how they would translate the group to the main roster. One of the main innovations suggested by Triple H was for Wyatt's entrance to be a subdued and spooky affair, eschewing the bombastic rock of other WWE stars and instead entering to a pitch dark arena only lit by the sickly glow of a lantern, like someone who had just walked out of the swamp. Fans immediately took to the group following their main roster debut on Raw in July 2013, organically starting to use the torches on their phones to light the arena as Wyatt made his entrance, eventually being dubbed as Fireflies by the cult leader. WWE analyst Sam Roberts later remembered that what you got is not just typical fan participation. You get this idea that everything this character is saying is true because every little light that is around this darkened arena represents somebody who is buying into whatever this malicious character is selling. So Wyatt may have been using oil to light his lantern, but it could just have easily been rocket fuel considering his stratospheric rise through the card in his first year on the main roster. He began with a feud with Kane, which culminated in a victory in a Ring of Fire match at SummerSlam 2013. He then had a brief dalliance with Kofi Kingston before attempting to recruit Daniel Bryan to the family at the very height of the Yes movement. And Brian even briefly drank the Kool-Aid before deciding that the boiler suit was taking the hipster himbo look a little bit too far in a rather memorable segment on Raw in January 2014. Brian would go on to win the main event at Mania 30, but not before taking a lovely clean L to Wyatt at the Rumble. Which left Wyatt with only really one babyface bigger to take on. John Cena. Bray prophesied that at the show of shows, he would show Cena to be fake, that his heroic act was a facade and all part of an era of lies. He would bring out the monster that Cena truly was. Then, at the event, Cena resisted the dark temptations of Swamp Daddy, managed to fight off the goon squad of Harper and Rowan, and handed Bray his first pinfall loss on the main roster, which which was a choice that WWE made, wasn't it? It was a choice that they made. Still mad about it. But it has to be said that it is still a remarkable achievement. The guy had only been working the character for two years, and in that time he'd gone from FCW development to a match against John Cena at the biggest wrestling event of the year. Wyatt had found gold in that there swamp, and though the cult leader was a character, the WWE audience and even management too were clearly in his sway. Though it is still worth noting that the lost Cena started a particular trend of Wyatt never really being able to do the business in the biggest matches. A factor that dogged him throughout his entire in-ring career for all the story and stunning character work, WWE booking always undermined the grand narrative. Wyatt saw out 2014 in feuds with Chris Jericho and Dean Ambrose before starting a set of spooky new promos around Rumble time in 2015. In them, Wyatt called himself the new face of fear, and eventually called out the dead man, the bloody Undertaker, Big Mark Watts' chops for a match at the Showcase of the Immortals. Though Undertaker was looking slightly more mortal than previously, having had his mania streak toppled by Brock Lesnar the year prior. Which did kind of mean that Bray's match against the Phenom was much more about getting Mark back on the horse than handing over a torch to a new ghoul king. Though Taker later did say that he had regained his confidence from working with Wyatt. 
So that's nice, I suppose. Later in that year, the Wyatt family grew again, adding big Braun Strowman to the ranks in what must have been a very difficult birth. But just like any family situation that's struggling, adding another kid is not always the solution doesn't necessarily fix things. But that short-term injection of new blood did give the Wyatts enough juice to go up against WWE's biggest ever star, The Rock. In an infamous and ill-fated encounter at WrestleMania 32 in which the Great One put down Eric Rowan in six seconds flat. The Rock failed the Redwood and uprooted the Wyatts for the rest of 2016 in the process. So the family was fragmented. Rowan and Harper drifted in and out of the faction through various short-term storylines and injuries, whereas Braun would be adopted by Raw, thus ending his association with the cult altogether. Though in August 2016, one prodigal son did come home as Harper returned to the nest and the pair of Bray and Luke managed to recruit Randy Orton to the family. And this all somehow led to Wyatt winning the WWE Championship at Elimination Chamber in 2017, making Wyndham the first of either the Wyndhams or the Rotundas to hold the prestigious championship. Though it was a short-lived glory, as Wyatt's reign was mostly to set up Orton's title victory at WrestleMania 33. And the feud also exposed some of the issues with Wyatt's unbound creativity and WWE's desire to sell a spooky character as supernatural rather than just as plainly super charismatic, which was always the biggest selling point of the cult leader character. So we got maggots projected into the ring. Orton burning down the Wyatt compound and the infamous House of Horrors match at Payback, a cinematic match that saw Orton and Wyatt duke it out at a creepy old shack as the audience in the arena watched on in utter bewilderment. And it was possibly an attempt by WWE to capture some of the cult adoration that the Hardys' final deletion had garnered a year prior, but without the sort of tongue-in-cheekiness of that match which gave it its B-movie brilliance. At the time, Vice said that the House of Horrors was bad because it fundamentally wasn't pro wrestling. And did that deter young Wyndham Rotunda? No siree, as we will see shortly enough. It wasn't just the Wyatt's compound that was left in ruins after the Orton feud either, as Wyatt's family had also all drifted apart, with Strowman breaking out as a single star and Harper and Rowan repackaged as the Bludgeon Brothers. Bray was essentially a shepherd without a flock. Fortunately, Wyatt found someone who could meet him on a similar level of crazed creativity, Matt Hardy. The pair started a rivalry which culminated in an ultimate deletion cinematic match at the Hardy compound and saw Bray pushed into the lake of reincarnation. I'm writing this bit at 11.25 at night, the day before recording, and now Laurie of Tomorrow is reading it, and all I, writing Laurie through the vessel of reading Laurie, can say is... Wrestling. Bray wasn't seen again until WrestleMania 34, where he returned to help Matt win the Andre the Giant Battle Royal and formed short-lived tag team the Deleters of Worlds. Hardy would eventually be off to nurse an injury, and Creative told Wyndham that they had nothing for him. Nothing. For that guy. Nothing. So he was sent home on forced hiatus in August and immediately went back to the drawing board knowing that his next idea could be the difference between his re-emergence in WWE or his release from the company. And what he came up with was unlike anything seen before in professional wrestling. Bray emerged from his hiatus in a bright red cardigan presenting saccharine kids TV show The Firefly Funhouse. Wyatt's Mr. Rogers-esque character was joined by this cast of self-referential puppet friends. We had Abby the Witch after Sister Abigail, Mercy the Buzzard, a nod towards Waylon Mercy who he took the previous gimmick from, Huskus the Pig Boy, based of the unflattering Husky Harris persona, and Rambling Rabbit, a jab back at the critique of Bray's promos being too long-winded and meandering. Then there was The Fiend, an evil clown who also occupied the funhouse and was there to take on Bray's enemies, a persona he could adopt when he needed to inflict violence. So he's gone from the Eater of Worlds to a literal spooky clown haunting the flood drains of WWE. And it was a manifestation of a broken psyche, always torn between the choice to hurt or to heal, which was printed on his gloves, a devil, an angel on his shoulder that he would listen to during his matches as this monstrosity. WWE producer Bruce Pritchard described the idea as follows. The Firefly Funhouse only existed in Bray's mind. It was not a real place. He would allow us inside his head and you could accept it because it was a fantasy, which is not necessarily true, Bruce, because Randy Orton 
definitely found the place and actually went there, didn't he? As I talked about in one of my explained episodes on The Fiend over on PFK, because yes, I have already made over an hour's worth of video on this, the funhouse didn't just have to be read as the shattered psyche of a man beaten down by the stagnation of his career. It was also some sort of limbo. And it's something Bray had alluded to for a while in 2015, Wyatt had been peppering his promos with loose lines that didn't really fit the flow of the promo, and when strung together, they were seemingly hinting at something. What makes you smile? I know you're listening. Let me in. We don't belong here. What happened to you was such a tragedy. Limbo is no place for a soul like yours. I believe I found the answer. The angel with the burnt wings is waving you on home. Now, Bray himself could have been the angel with burnt wings, considering his rather large back tattoo and the fact that his compound burned down. But Lucifer is also a pretty well-known fallen angel. Why himself even claimed after his dip in the Lake of Reincarnation that, to me, Abigail was a delicious poison, an intoxicating, overwhelming poison, but Abigail don't live here no more. I am Samael. Samael is the name of an archangel with grim and destructive duties. He's the Jewish angel of death and also fallen. Samael is often lumped in with Satan due to his fallen angel status and his reaping duties, but is also said to rule the fifth heaven, so simultaneously good and bad, in a limbo between good and evil. The reading of the fun house as either hell or limbo is helped by the fact that the door is daubed with the phrase, abandon all hope ye who exit here, in a nod to Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, in which written above the gates of hell is abandon all hope ye who enter here. If you're exiting here and abandoning hope, where are you going? Now, another reading on the fun house is that it could be a form of regression as a kind of trauma response. Bray becomes this smiley, happy character who surrounds themselves with puppets and childlike wonder in order to suppress some darkness that is bubbling up from below. And also as a way to reckon with his career, literally creating a puppet of his boss, Vince McMahon, who has devil horns and laughs at all of the inappropriate violence and at Bray's expense. Wyndham was telling a few stories here, all layered on top of one another. One kayfabe about this new character emerging from a broken cult leader, a shoot one about career satisfaction and reflecting on what he had achieved in WWE, and potentially even one about trauma and cycles of violence. Which I can't say is real or that something traumatic happened to Wyndham Rotunda in his childhood, but he was always hinting at there being something more in his evolving storylines, telling Ryan Satin in an interview after his next character reinvention that Uncle Howdy, Bray, and all these things, they are all real. They are based on moments and things that have really happened. So Uncle Howdy, there is so much more to it than you think. And this interweaving of kayfabe, self-critique, and shoot life stories was something that Wyndham did that will forever be his legacy. Sure, some people have broken kayfabe before or based a storyline off of something that was really happening to supercharge it. I mean, Bray's old mate Matt Hardy can tell you about that live, but not many people have managed to so expertly walk the line between all of these things to blend them so seamlessly into one genre-breaking experience. Bray was making a horror film through the medium of wrestling. Interestingly, horror films are often all about trauma and dealing with it. Babadook, which The Fiend and Uncle Howdy both look like, by the way. And Bray's slasher villain was The Fiend, who debuted at SummerSlam 2019, carrying the decapitated head of cult leader Wyatt and proceeded to murder Finn Balor in short shrift. The Fiend would go on to hunt and kill wrestling legends like Kurt Angle, Jerry Lawler and Mick Foley. The presentation told us that he was an unstoppable monster. And the look was right out of a horror film too, partly due to the help of genre masters Tom Savini and Jason Baker, who collaborated on the props with Wyndham. Unfortunately, B 
being unstoppable in a world of immovable objects isn't always going to work out, the most immovable object of all being WWE's booking strategy, which didn't know exactly how to deal with a character like this. So the fantasy was quickly dispelled when The Fiend faced Seth Rollins for the Universal Championship at Hell in a Cell, a match where the monster kept coming back to life as our final girl Seth Rollins threw more and more at it before eventually a referee stepped in and called it off because a Rollins hurt the evil clown too much with a hammer. Not only should this just not happen in the Hell in a Cell match, it definitely shouldn't happen to your bloody Jason Voorhees character, thus undermining it entirely. Don't book the match. Now, the course was corrected briefly after The Fiend toppled Rollins later in that month in a Last Man Standing match at Crown Jewel. And despite the wobbles in sticking the landing, The Fiend proved to be a hit with the WWE audience, with viewers voting it the gimmick of the year in Wrestling Observer's 2019 End of Year Awards. According to Dave Meltzer, the plan after Wyatt won the Universal title was for him to rampage through opponents until he could face Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 36. And that decidedly did not happen. Reportedly, due to a knee-jerk reaction from Vince McMahon who decided that Goldberg... Goldberg would be a better foe for Roman. So, he booked The Fiend to lose to Bill at Super Showdown in February in three minutes flat. Bray found out the hard way that devil's bargains never tend to shake out the way you expected. With the title lost and fans generally down on the booking decisions, the next move for The Fiend was kind of critical. And to be perfectly honest, the next announced opponent didn't exactly inspire hope that the monster was about to get his mojo back. As it was announced the very next night that Cena wins lol, John Cena would be his adversary for Mania. Plans for that show were turned on their head by the COVID-19 pandemic, which meant that the show was moved to the Performance Center and critically that fans wouldn't be in attendance. So with the rule book torn up on how to run a wrestling show, it actually provided Wyatt an opportunity to flex some of those creative muscles, ultimately culminating in the Firefly Funhouse match. It was a cinematic sequence that saw Wyatt walk Cena through a critique of his entire career, the booking of the golden boy, how that held others down, and ultimately caused Big Match John enough psychic damage to put him down for a three and right a years old wrong in WWE's booking. Some fans, me included, loved this experimental style of match, how it widened the scope of Wyatt's work to reflect on the business in general and how it needled the biggest star of the modern era of WWE, leveling some of those same criticisms at him that fans had discussed online for years. Wyndham, Cena and Creative had come up with something self-aware full of the sort of winks and nods that made the final deletion match a winner, but far, far riskier. At WrestleMania, they played this mad snapshot vignette package tearing apart their biggest star. Some fans, of course, didn't like it to each their own, some echoing Vice with cries that it fundamentally wasn't pro wrestling, but others felt like they'd seen something special. Wyndham had finally found a way to tell the kind of story he wanted to tell in wrestling without necessarily being shackled by the form of wrestling. And all it took was a pandemic to do it. But not every match White had during this era was a success. As the cinematic matches continued, but soon returned to their House of Horrors-ish roots, as Bray challenged Braun Strowman to a Wyatt swamp fight at the horror show at Extreme Rules. The pandemic was a dark time. A match that was universally panned by critics. But it did at least see Alexa Bliss ally herself with Wyatt, and The Fiend eventually would go on to win the Universal Championship once more. The Fiend would lose the Universal Championship and at TLC would face Randy Orton in a Firefly Inferno match. The match ended with The Fiend being set on fire, after which he was supposed to return as the, the Kentucky Fry Fiend sort of new melted version of the character. Wyatt returned at Fastlane in the new gimmick, looking like a slab of old ham, but backstage was said to be unhappy with the change, least of all because the costume was apparently difficult to move around in, let alone wrestle in. So at WrestleMania 37, The Fiend regenerated to his pre-burned form for a match with Randy Orton, where the creature was betrayed by Alexa Bliss for a loss to Orton in its big return match. 
Unsurprisingly, fans were less than impressed with this particular decision and now the wonky presentation and bad booking was beginning to catch up to The Fiend. Just one year after it won Best Gimmick in the 2019 Observer Awards, that same character won the worst gimmick in the 2020 version of those awards. Once again, Bray found himself back in creative limbo, barely making any TV appearances before shockingly being released as part of a series of pandemic-era talent cuts in July 2021. The reasons for Wyndham's release are not totally clear. Some accounts say it's because of creative differences and or him being deemed difficult to work with. Dave Meltzer meanwhile reported later that Wyndham was secretly dealing with a medical issue relating to his heart. So naturally, speculation began to run rampant about where Wyndham would end up next, with many touting interest from AEW, TNA, Japan and Mexico too, and the man himself was clearly beginning to ruminate on his next wrestling iteration, changing his name to Wyndham Six on social media, suggesting that he would end up somewhere where he couldn't use the WWE trademarked Bray Wyatt name. However, things have a funny way of shaking out as in the summer of 2022, devil-horned Vince McMahon stepped back from creative duties and Triple H took over. Wyndham quickly went back to referring to himself as Bray Wyatt as it transpired that he was in advanced discussion with Trips about a return to the company. So wrestling's worst kept secret was heavily teased by WWE throughout September as the company began to feature Easter eggs like QR codes flashing on screen or in the background of shots, and these would lead to minigames, riddles, and images that alluded to Wyatt's return, but with a dose of baked-in mystery. Then, during the closing moments of Extreme Rules in October, the arena went black. A haunting rendition of He's Got the Whole World in His Hands began playing. Life-sized versions of Wyatt's puppets appeared in the crowd, and now we know that this was foreshadowing for the eventual reveal of the Wyatt Six. On stage, a bright light shone through the cracks in an old wooden door, potentially showing a return from the funhouse or a return from hell or limbo itself. The door slams open and out walks a masked Bray Wyatt carrying a lantern, announcing, I'm here, before blowing out the lantern to close the show. Now, the mask was clearly inspired by horror movies like Black Phone, and looking closely shares a lot of similarities with the Uncle Howdy mask Wyndham's brother Taylor would wear when taking on the character. The pop for Wyatt's return was deafening inside the arena, and online fans were more than pleased to see him back in WWE and excited for another reinvention from that master of mystery. And Wyatt's return to weekly TV kicked this latest story off in a most intriguing fashion, as Wyndham seemingly spoke from the heart, telling the crowd that this was a version he never got to introduce to you guys, saying, this is just me being me, genuine me, for the first time. It was heartfelt and it resonated with the crowd, but as expected, things quickly took a sinister turn the following week, as Wyatt talked about revenge being a confession of pain, stated that the crowd had pulled the spears out of his ribs and yanked him up, which is all a little bit messiah complexy. And then he confessed that along this journey, I'm going to do horrible, horrible things, but I will never feel sorry for them. I'm just a servant now. I go where the circle takes me. While released from the company, Wyatt had briefly started using a red circle as his profile picture on social media, potentially symbolizing the cycle of violence. The circle he follows, oscillating between calm, happy even, and destructive. It's a cycle his former character had followed too, alternating between Mr. Rogers' warm smile and the fiend's rictus grin. Bray was confessing to being led down a dark path once again by something from his past. Revenge is a confession of pain. His violence now is a product of some violence done to him. Hurt people hurt people. And we soon found out who was leading Bray down that path. Uncle Howdy. And again, whether this is just a character trope or something more, it's not for me to say. But as Wyatt told Ryan Satin in the interview where he said all of these things are real, it's not just some cut and dry spooky man in the background. There's more to it. There's complexities that you haven't got to see yet. There's things that I don't understand about it. And that's the beauty of it. It's going to grow organically, but the story of it I don't even think it's been told yet. And once you understand what it really is and where it came from in my childhood and who Howdy really is, 
it's kind of much deeper than you think. So Uncle Howdy first appeared like a desiccated corpse dredged up from the earth, another inspiration taken from its namesake, Captain Howdy from the 1983 comedy horror film Hysterical. In that film, Howdy is an adulterous lighthouse keeper who drives his lover to murder-suicide when he spurns her, and her spirit then chooses to resurrect Howdy as a revenant in order to enact revenge on this town, thus continuing the cycle of violence. And interestingly, undead Howdy's first on-screen moment sees him burst through the bottom of a boat carrying a lantern. So could Bray's Howdy be something he summoned in order to enact revenge, his confession of pain? Interestingly, circles in the world of ritual magic are also said to protect the casters from the thing that they have summoned. So there's another potential layer in that. Howdy too would also oscillate between helping and hindering Wyatt, with the pair eventually allying during Wyatt's Mountain Dew pitch black match at the 2023 Royal Rumble with LA Knight. In the match, Wyatt was back to his monstrous self, masked and unstoppable, while the ring was glowing with a sort of neon body paint. Yet another example of Wyatt's storyline clashing with WWE's choice of presentation. After this, Wyatt was briefly planned to go against Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania, which then got switched to Bobby Lashley before being dropped entirely, because it turned out that Wyndham had caught COVID, which had caused complications with his heart. He spent the next few months trying to recover and was eventually discharged from hospital. For a little time, there was optimism that he would be able to return to the ring, but in August, he was briefly readmitted to hospital before being sent home with a defibrillator vest that he was supposed to wear at all times in case he suffered a sudden heart attack. On the 24th of August, 2023, Wyndham took a nap on the couch at his home in Claremont, Florida, but he had left the vest in his car. Sometime later, when his wife Jojo tried to wake him, she realized he was not breathing. He was rushed to hospital, but it was too late. Wyndham Rotunda had died of a massive heart attack at just 36 years old. And as the wrestling world processed the awful news, WWE prepared for an episode of SmackDown the following day in Louisville, Kentucky. The show turned into a tribute for both Wyndham and for the legendary Terry Funk, who had died earlier in the same week. The tributes to Wyndham included a 10-bell salute, a single rocking chair on the stage after an emotional tribute video, and a lit lantern left alone in the ring to close the show as fans around the arena became the Fireflies one more time. And that is where the legacy of Bray Wyatt could have stopped with a life cut tragically short and an idea unfulfilled. If someone had not been there to carry that torch, or in this case, the lantern. His brother Taylor later said, he's not gone because the art he left and his ideas will live on forever. And it was Taylor who decided to use some of those ideas to continue the family wrestling legacy. During Bray's final run in WWE, Taylor had been portraying Uncle Howdy on screen alongside his brother. And then, in mid-2024, teases began to air on Raw that seemed to allude to something to do with Uncle Howdy and the Wyatt name. Then, in late June, a new faction debuted in an unhinged segment on Raw as a twisted vision of Sister Abigail crawled out of a really familiar doorway before cameras travelled backstage to find carnage in gorilla position with bodies strewn everywhere and figures that looked eerily familiar lurking in the darkness. The group was later revealed to be the Wyatt Six, stylized as Six, S-I-C-K-S, seemingly a continuation of the Wyndham Six that was teased on social media while Wyndham had been released from WWE. The new faction was headed by Uncle Howdy, aka Taylor Rotunda, Wyndham's brother, with Nikki Cross as Sister Abigail, Dexter Loomis as Mercy the Buzzard, Joe Gacy as Huskus the Pig Boy, and Eric Rowan returning to the Wyatt Fold as Ramblin' Rabbit, seemingly with a sixth member still to be revealed, at least at the time of me recording this. Then, Things took a classically weird turn as The Six delivered a videotape to Michael Cole the following week on Raw, which showed Uncle Howdy interviewing Bo Dallas, Taylor Rotunda. The vignette had Howdy ask Bo how he felt when his brother died, if he was exploiting his brother's legacy, and if he even remembers 
who he is. And Bo responds in this, saying, what was he supposed to do? Was he supposed to let his brother become a mausoleum? And that all he ever wanted his entire life was to be like his brother. He said, I looked up to him and I wanted to be him. So Bray's legacy of interweaving the shoot and the kayfabe, real life and storyline, is alive and well in these promos as Taylor takes on a form he has literally shared with Wyndham. The following promo would have Howdy ask Bo if he honestly believed that he brought them to life, with the pair eventually combining and in one voice saying, I set them free, I freed them from the cave, seemingly alluding to the fact that the puppets had come to life as it's revealed that the two are sat inside the Firefly Funhouse. So Bo, as both Dallas and Howdy, is now literally sat inside Bray's shattered psyche, inside his ideas, trying to continue his legacy and assume the mantle that he left behind. But he's also sat inside the place that Bray regressed to, to, to reckon with his career and potentially this something that may or may not have happened in real life that Bray's alluded to in all those interviews. Now, Bo is doing the exact same thing with the very real trauma of losing his brother in absolutely tragic circumstances. Triple H said of Wyndham that he put his heart and soul out on his sleeve. It's one of the geniuses of him. It's also one of the things that was difficult to work with him on. Sometimes the hardest thing to talk him into was, okay, but how do we make that work in the ring? And that was sometimes the trick. He was so creative and so outside the box that pulling it back into a particular genre was hard for him to do. But that's one of the most charming things about Wyndham as a performer. He was always pushing at the walls of what wrestling could be, actively trying to advance what could be done within the confines of this medium that thrives on its formula. So he was a mad scientist, he was, a, he was a tinkerer, he was playing with how to tell a story from week to week. He was also a master orator, able to weave a narrative so deftly and with so much mystery that fans would have their own stringboard theories as to what was going on. Again, I've made hour-long videos about this! He also inspired a new generation of talent to begin building out the lore of their characters, to, to create a world around them that's not just dictated by the wins and the losses between the ropes, but that exists in every single breadcrumb dropped along the path, in every promo, in every cryptic social media post, something to be poured over and unpicked by the faithful. He was also someone who managed to wrap the real world up in this grand fantastical narrative to, to sort of expertly walk that tricky tightrope of kayfabe versus reality and attempt to satisfy both with these amazing and bizarre inventions. You only need to look at the Firefly Funhouse to know that this guy knew exactly who he was knew exactly how he was seen and exactly what he wanted to say. It wasn't always neat, it wasn't ever simple, and it wasn't even always wrestling. But Bray Wyatt's legacy is one of passion for pro wrestling, for storytelling, for childlike wonder. As Wyndham himself said, wrestling is not a love story. It's much more. It's hope, an excuse to be a kid again, and nothing matters except the moment we are in. And like so much of his WWE story, it's also about family, both real and found, about seeing yourself in something, seeing something that chimes with you personally and then enjoying it all together. And with a lantern now carried by Wyndham's own brother, the story continues, the legacy gets to live on. We've had the hurt, now it's time to heal. Well, thank you so much for watching this video on the legacy of Bray Wyatt. If you enjoyed it, uh, please leave a comment down below letting us know what you think. Like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you do want to help us make more of these essay style videos, why not join us on Patreon? Patreon.com forward slash WrestleTalk, link in the video description down below. Uh, if you want to watch more long form video content and essays, there's one on screen right now about Roman Reigns and the Bloodline Saga.